I did stick my Twitter handle in the bottom corner because I love it when people tweet offensive things about me. Uh, something I would say is I've spent the day talking to many of you lovely people, so I've almost lost my voice. If, unfortunately, I do lose my voice, I will continue in the medium of interpretive dance, uh, but also you know, we'll make sure that there's a version of this you can see later. Uh, it is being recorded. Uh, also, my slide deck, when the slide deck gets published, has the entire script. So if you can't make out my broad Scottish accent, you're covered. Uh, and you press down for the next slide. So, um, firstly, who am I? Uh, I'm at a heart a maker. I love to build things. Uh, I build uh, many kind of different things. And I don't, I'm a distinguished engineer at MongoDB, but I don't work in product development. I actually work these days in developer relations. So I don't build the core products themselves. I build things with them. And I feed that back, my experiences, to our product teams, to our developers, and I also feed it back to, to groups like yourself. So I get paid to build cool stuff and tell you all about it, which is, in fact, the best job in the world. Um, I'm also a full stack engineer. And when I say a full stack engineer, I trained as a geologist so that I could find silicon to build the chips. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I will, but these days, I don't, I don't so much make my own chips these days, but I do build my own hardware, my own firmware, my own operating systems, all the way up to kind of large scale enterprise and the highest level of software development, building something called documentation. Um, so a little bit about me, um, I, I basically, I build fun stuff for a living uh, using enterprise technology, principally using MongoDB's um, Atlas developer data platform, and occasionally turning to AWS when I need some heavy lifting. I also have a family. Um, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and one of the things I have to do is help care for an elderly relative. And this is, this is relevant. We will get to event-driven bits, don't worry. Um, so they live alone. They are in their 90s. They have uh, fairly severe dementia to the extent that they do not remember what happened three minutes previously. Um, but they're very keen to stay living at home. And we're keen for them to stay living at home as long as possible, as long as they remember to eat, drink, as long as we know if they've had visitors. You know, even if you pick up the phone, even if they answer the phone and you say, has anybody visited you today? The answer is going to be uh, no. You know, even though 12 people could have been in to see them. So um, it is one of the, the tragedies of the elderly. Um, and in the end, we decided that we needed to keep an eye on this person, literally. A uh, few incidents meant that, that we had to be able to tell, you know, had they eaten? Had they got up that morning? Had they had the visitors they were supposed to have? And for those of you worrying about privacy, this particular person is, is deemed actually not to have the mental capacity to make their own decisions on this. Their care team, on the other hand, and those with power of attorney said, no, we need a camera. We need to be able to see what this elderly person is doing. And of course, being the technical one in the family, it fell to me to build or buy this. So they came and they said, so, uh, camera. Can you come up with a discrete camera that we can put in there and we can see what's happening? Now, as I said earlier, I don't like to buy stuff. It's never quite what I want. I'd rather build it myself. And so I decided that I would build a camera, subtly, I'd done this before, to, to watch this person. It would upload the images to something where we could view it with a, a browser on a mobile phone. And importantly, Nobody wants to spend their time sitting watching a video of an old person. At least nobody normal does. Uh, you know, this person's life, there's a degree of privacy. This is not a soap opera. This is not reality TV. And so I decided that rather than watching it, I would let artificial intelligence watch it for me and just give me a summary of the bits and pieces I need to know. I, I don't need to look at what this old person is doing unless I'm told to. So, this slide shows the overall architecture. Now, there's lots of boxes there, and I'm hoping you can read what's written in them. We're actually going to work our way around this and talk about the various parts of this architecture. Uh, roughly, orange is AWS things, blue is MongoDB Atlas developer data platform things, gray is a browser, and red is a camera. So red uh, is this little thing here. This is uh, an ESP32 camera. It's basically a camera with a microprocessor. I've stuck a, a USB power board on the back of it. They cost about 10 pounds. You program them with Python or C++. Um, 
they have Wi-Fi. Although they're very, very slow, the CPU in them is, you know, by modern standards, very slow. They have dedicated encryption chips in them, which means they can do HTTPS. And so I wrote code for this, or I, I modified code I'd already written for this, which basically every minute takes a photograph and it uploads it to MongoDB using MongoDB's data API. So MongoDB has a, an API which is, doesn't require any particular libraries, it just uses uh, HTTPS. I did consider encrypting the images in the camera before I uploaded them, and then I would decrypt them in the browser when I retrieved them so that they were encrypted in cloud. This is actually something that MongoDB is quite big on, is this idea of why ever trust your cloud provider? If you can have end-to-end -end encryption where the client ends encrypt the data, upload it, and download it, that's good. And we have stuff built into our libraries to actually do that for you automatically so that no decrypted data or, uh, is ever in the cloud. Ditto, the decryption keys are never in the cloud. So you can have a zero trust relationship with your cloud provider. But in this case, I didn't do that because I do actually need to have the back-end service literally look at the image for me to work out what it's showing so it can let me know if there's anything out of the ordinary. Now, this is probably a good time to talk about MongoDB. Unsurprisingly, I'm here to talk about MongoDB. It's not a sales pitch, but it, it is somewhat informative. So just to explain what is MongoDB. MongoDB is a, is a document database, okay? So it's a strongly typed transactional document database. It's not a JSON database. We'll cover that in a moment or two. Um, it has records. Records have fields. Fields have names. Names have values with data types. It's not storing JSON inside. It's actually binary data. The real difference between a document database and a traditional RDBMS tabular database is that we say it's okay for a given field to have multiple values in a record. We have arrays, if you like, as a first order data type. That's really the key difference between a document database and a traditional RDBMS. But it means then that where previously you might have needed two tables, sometimes you can get away with just one. Um, so I store my images in MongoDB and I store the image as a, as a binary blob. I store the date of the image as a date, not as a string representing the date. Uh, and the other thing I store in there up front is the, the name of the camera. Because although I've built this for myself, it's built on a, an enterprise stack that could easily support 100,000 cameras. Um, just to be clear on the JSON thing, we do use JSON to represent MongoDB data to humans, like here. Because if we show you just a bunch of bytes, it doesn't look good. But really, you know, the relationship that MongoDB has with JSON is the same one that Oracle has with CSV. That didn't even get a snigger. It's a hard audience at this time of day. It wasn't very funny, to be fair. Um, so the advantage of doing this is you can co-locate your data. If I choose to embed one table inside another, if you like, it's co-located, it's explicitly joined, it's easier to query, it's quicker to query, it's quicker to retrieve. Um, so that's basically what a da document database is. It's mostly like a relational database, but it, it's got a bit of depth to it. The real secret sauce for MongoDB is its API. So when we Kind of, I'd say we created this kind of database, but we didn't. It was created in the 1970s by the company I worked for previously. But when MongoDB popularized the idea of a document database, the real thing that they got right was the API. The secret sauce of MongoDB is its API, which is a really nice way of interacting with objects. You could have used SQL, but SQL doesn't have support for arrays and objects, and we would have to have a custom one. What MongoDB did is it said, look, actually, most of the time, you don't want your queries, your operations to be text. You literally want an API, an SDK, to interact with that using objects. And so, um, as in this example here, you know, what we do is we get connections to the database, we create an object, we'll call it a document, we set some fields in that, and then we say, find what objects are like this, and we get back an array of those objects. Everything is done with objects. Even more importantly, when we're updating data, we're gonna pass two things to that API call. One is 
find documents that match this, like our find, and the other is modify them in a way like this. And that's an atomic operation where it can say, if the document is in this state, modify it like this. So we don't read the document from the database, change it at the client, write it back again. That's both inefficient in terms of a network, but also it gives you all kinds of contention issues. Now, I'm kind of confident in saying that this API uh, the, the query API is the best way to work with this. And um, the reason I'm confident in saying that is that Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM have all implemented this exact same MongoDB API on top of their own databases because they acknowledge that this is a great way to work with this data. Unfortunately, at best, they have about 35% of the functionality, but the will is there. So anyway, the thing about this, uh, and if I just go back a slide, um, if we look down, kind of halfway down the screen, we'll see it says query.salary is LT50,000. That means less than 50,000. So we can express not just an exact match, but we can express things like, you know, find where the salary is less than 50,000. That's all part of it being a software development kit, an SDK, where we've defined that LT function in your programming language. Um, and this can be, you know, programming language of your choice. We have this for Java, we have it for C Sharp, we have it for JavaScript, we have it for Python, we have it for Ruby, you get the idea. But sometimes you cannot use that SDK. It's a library, you'd link it in. Sometimes you're programming in an environment where you can't do that. Guess what? If you're programming on a microcontroller, which only has like 64 kilobytes of memory on it, you're not gonna be including this SDK. So that's why we created um, the data API, and the data API is that same API without the library. So basically, if you want to call, call MongoDB, but you do not want to include the libraries, um, or rather, you're unable to include the libraries, because it, it, not including the libraries when you could is not a great idea, uh, that's what the data API is for. I'm still gonna get to events, don't worry. So anyway, we upload the images to the system. Uh, next, and, and we program it using the, in my case, the Arduino IDE, which is a lovely little IDE that we can use for programming microprocessor boards. Quick show of hands, anybody done any microprocessor, Arduino IDE, small computing? Yeah, actually, it's about half the room. That's nice to see. I know you're a like, big computing enterprise people nowadays, but small computers can be fun too. So the next thing, is I did need to be able to view this information. I need to be able to see these images that I've uploaded. So all of that's built on MongoDB's uh, developer data platform. So we have static hosting. I'm hosting basically a single web page, uh, which I use to do this. Uh, obviously the data is held in the MongoDB cluster because that's what we uploaded it to. I have Atlas functions and triggers. So in that, I'm actually able to uh, define a function on the server which returns me not just the image, but associated metadata, and then call it from the web page. So MongoDB has a browser SDK that lets you call serverless functions. You know, think, if you like, of a browser SDK that lets you call Lambda functions, but without you actually having to do all of the HTTPS endpoints, uh, making HTTPS calls, but that are all wrapped up in a secure RPC mechanism. And then that's all tied into app services authentication, because obviously if I'm gonna build an app like this, I need somebody to log in. Now, because I like showing code samples, this is the code that needs to go in the browser for this. So just to quickly walk through this, uh, I include the, uh, the appropriate library at the top or the appropriate uh, JavaScript from a CDN. I create a, a realm.app object and I pass it my unique ID for my application, which the back end gives me. I check if there is a currently user logged in, and if not, I can pass it different kinds of credentials. Here I'm passing username and password. I've simplified this code slightly just to make it easier. Um, I wait for the login, and then I can actually just call a function on the server. So that's all the code I need in a web page to securely and authenticatedly call a server-side function that knows who I am and can pass that credentials down to the, the database. Really, really nice for building applications. Everybody thinks, yeah, I'm gonna build a web service and I'm gonna call it with Axios. That's an ugly kind of uh, 
way of doing it. It's much nicer to actually have a proper RPC mechanism that deals with all the data typing and everything else. And bear in mind, data typing matters. You know, a JSON doesn't do dates. So you, know, you end up having to process all of that yourself. And then the second part of this is I created a serverless function. So rather than call the database API, I prefer uh, once upon a time it's called three-tier architecture. I'm going to make business functions that do just what I want them to do, and then I'm going to call them from my client end. So I have a function that I can call that says, get me the latest image. In this case, this is a server-side serverless function that is literally all the code it needs to go to a particular collection, a particular table, find the latest image, and send it back to me as a binary type. I've actually improved on this function a little bit in the latest version because it not only returns the image, but it returns various bits of metadata like what's the ID of the previous image? What's the ID of the previous image that had more than two people in it? And so on. We'll get to that in a moment. And at this point, I can start talking about events, but this is literally what this app looks like. I have this on my phone just now. Um, yes, it's ugly because I am not a graphic designer, but fundamentally, um, uh, what I did is I changed the CSS on it just to black out those boxes. Those boxes would normally just be a green outline um, showing inside my, my relative's house somebody is actually sitting on the floor talking to somebody sitting on the chair. And I can say, you know, go back 15 minutes, show me the previous photo, show me the last time somebody was seen. What you will see in that, of course, is it's tagged where the people are. This is where the event-driven magic comes in. So... Here's where we're going to be going with this architecture. So the uh, camera throws the image into the database. The database is then going to uh, trigger a trigger. I don't really know what the word is for that, but the database has triggers, which are, I am going to execute this code, or I'm going to perform this action when there is a data change inside me of a certain kind. Um, that is going to send it to EventBridge. And then EventBridge is going to uh, use a rule to trigger a Lambda function, which will send it to recognition, along what's doing in CloudWatch. Uh, recognition, if you're not familiar with it, is AWS's uh, give me a picture and I'll tell you stuff about it serverless function. So in terms of Atlas triggers, uh, Atlas has three kinds of triggers. Triggers on a data change. And that has a huge amount of flexibility. It's like, oh, an update where this field was changed to a value greater than three. Um, it has a timed triggers, which literally just run on a schedule. Please, please execute the following code on a schedule. And it also has uh, authentication triggers. So when somebody creates a new user in the system, for example, we can trigger creating data for them. Um, in this case, what I've done is I've set up a a trigger that says when a new image or a new document is inserted in the images collection, I want you to send that to AWS EventBridge. Now, I can send it just to a JavaScript serverless function on the MongoDB side. And that can include NPM modules, so I could do processing in there. I could have sent it to that and then sent it to AWS via uh, the uh, sort of HTTP SDKs for uh, AWS. But this is an event-driven conference, and so I thought, I'm just going to send it via EventBridge. And that is as simple as basically saying, this database, this collection, on insert, and you click the box that says EventBridge, and it does ask you to put your AWS account ID in, which is just cut off the bottom there. Uh, sorry, I pressed in the wrong direction. That then appears in AWS as a partner event source. So partner event sources basically have their own event bus, where events that are coming in from an external thing appear. So getting stuff from MongoDB to AWS, given certain conditions, you just set up the conditions and say, if this happens, send it to the event bus. Um, what I then do is once it arrives on my event bus, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you lots about how w AWS works at this point, because I'm just kind of assuming that you know some of that stuff. Um, but basically, that's going to call a Lambda function. I wrote my Lambda function in Python. Why is it written in Python? Uh, one, I like writing Python. Two, I also like writing Java, but if I write it in Java, I have to write it separately and upload it. I actually just wanted to write it in the nice little box in the GUI. Um, and three, I don't particularly like JavaScript, so I thought I'll write it in Python. So I have a Python function here uh, that receives the incoming data, and what it then does is it sends it off to recognition. Now, how does it send it to recognition? 
I use the Boto2 library, so I use the, the actual uh, SDK for AWS inside that Python function, and I send it off to recognition. And originally, I was just asking recognition to just basically tell me what was in the image and where it was. So it returns you, there's a person, here's a bounding box. There's a person, there's a bounding box, there's a dog. Um, I then had some amazing insight reading the documentation for recognition. It has a moderation <coughs> API. Somebody's smiling because they've seen what's coming here. Okay? The moderation API tells you if images are not safe for work. Do you know what I don't want to do? I don't want to look at a camera with a naked old person on it. <laughs> so, so it actually flags these images to let me know the state of dress of said person. And that goes in the database as well, so that the viewer will not show me those unless I explicitly click the, it's OK to show me not safe for work. So I make two API calls to recognition. One is, what's in the image? The two is, is it OK to look at this? Um, and then the errors from this, uh, for those of you who don't know, get thrown into a CloudWatch log. So that was kind of handy while I was debugging it and understanding it. Now, I was new to this. This was the first time I'd kind of played with, with Lambda like this. And so what I should have done, because what I want to do now is I want to put it back on EventBridge. What I probably should have done is hooked up the output side of this function to um, an EventBridge uh, bus and just output and put back on it. But I didn't realize that. So actually, uh, incorrectly, I make an API call from this function using that same library, the, the SDK, to write it back to EventBridge. But that works for me anyway. Um, and I didn't rewrite it because it worked. So the results get sent back to EventBridge. So what we're getting here is the output from the uh, recognition functions gets sent back to the default event bus. And then the default event bus is going to write that back to MongoDB using that HTTP-based data API. Again, because it's HTTP-based, um, we can actually call it directly from the event bus rules. So event bus can take things, uh, event bridge can take things and send them to external APIs. Uh, you just have to configure it to do that. I don't have to write code. Could have sent it directly from the Lambda function, but again, you know, why not use the event bus? Um, that ran into an interesting problem. As in, I set it up, I configured it, I thought correctly, and it didn't work. And I could see at the MongoDB end that the function had been called to update the database, but the update was not happening. And MongoDB end just said, I got a call and I did nothing. The logs didn't tell me anything useful. In the end, I realized what I needed to do to find out what was going on was set up a, a dead letter box on the event bridge end of this, then set the number of retries to one so that I could see what the output of this was. And at that point, I discovered that the function was failing and MongoDB was returning an error message. I just didn't know at first how to get that error message back when it was event bridge writing directly to an external API. Now, here comes the fun bit. Uh, the reason it complained was because AWS was sending this, content type application JSON char set UTF-8 which seems an entirely reasonable thing to send to an HTTPS API. The error message said, content type must be application JSON or application eJSON. Bit strange. This is where I have to explain a little bit. So to be clear, it's a bug, but I'd like to explain why and also how to fix it. So one of the problems with JSON is JSON has some really horrible limitations. JSON is just text. It's a textual representation of data. And it misses some important type information. So for example, I have a, an object at the top there. And I'm inserting it into MongoDB. But actually, I don't need to insert it into MongoDB. I literally can just define that object. And you'll see the score at the bottom is a fairly big number. The problem is JSON and indeed JavaScript in general, cannot represent that number. It changes it to the number below, and you'll see the last digit has changed. You get rounding errors, because JSON and JavaScript by implication only has IEEE floating point numbers, unless somebody's explicitly defined 64-bit integers and things like that. MongoDB, on the other hand, has proper data types for dealing with big numbers, money, stuff like that. So. 
we don't advise using JSON to read and write stuff into MongoDB because it's lossy. Dates are another problem. That date is a string. MongoDB has dates. <coughs> JSON, JavaScript has dates, but JSON doesn't have dates. So we have a thing called eJSON. And eJSON, or extended JSON, basically allows us to give you the information about the data types. It's JSON, but it's extended to include information about this is a date. This is not a string. This is a long, and here is the value. And actually, the value has to be a string there because JavaScript can't represent that as a number correctly. So MongoDB has this concept of eJSON. And when we send data to the API, it would like us to tell it if it's JSON or eJSON. So it knows whether to store exactly what you see there or convert those types to the correct data types. When this relatively new code was implemented, the developer made a mistake where they thought they were just checking for the string prefix and they didn't. They accidentally checked the whole string. So because uh, AWS was correctly sending this and this is UTF-8, it failed. So it's a bug, it's now fixed, but it didn't slow me up long because, remember I said we can do these server-side functions, these serverless functions? I created this serverless function, um, which basically does the exact same thing that the data API would do. It takes the incoming record and it uses it to update the database. Um, it is, it's almost identical to the code that the actual data API uses. The data API, actually uses these functions and this mechanism, and then we just tie it to an HTTPS endpoint. So this is, in AWS terms, what is this? This is, um, um, help me out here, API Gateway. You know, I, I, here's HTTP, please point it at uh, this Lambda function. So I was able to basically create my own function that did update one and didn't have this bug. So that, it, you know, it took me no time at all to get around that. That then means that EventBridge can now write directly to MongoDB. It just wasn't calling the actual API, it was calling my function in my own API. So now I've, I've closed that loop. We're getting the data out via EventBridge from a trigger, we're enhancing it, and we're writing it back again. Uh, so uh, yeah, not everything goes perfectly in software. There are bugs. We, as a company, are pretty good at fixing them, that bug, you know, took less than a month to fix, but there are always workarounds as well. Now, as I said up front though, I really don't want to keep an eye on this old person. I don't want to be you know, watching this. I don't want a video monitor in the corner of my living room. Just no, nobody would. Um, it also, you know, this concept doesn't scale either, because with the best will in the world, we're not gonna be sitting in shifts seeing if somebody's lying on the floor. Um, so what I needed was an overview of the information and the behavior. I want to be able to look once a day and see how has this day been? You know, did they get out of bed this day? Um, equally, I want some immediate notification for exception conditions, specifically, hey, there's somebody lying on the floor because this old person should not be lying on the floor of their living room. And just to be clear, we only have a camera in the living room. Um, so, if you forgive the pun, I have to be event-driven too. Uh, an old person in the bottom of the frame, like this, uh, bad Photoshop, uh, not, not actual old person, um, needs an immediate response. So I need each new image to be checked to see whether or not it looks like this. Now actually, this is fairly simple because this is there is a person with a certain confidence that it is actually a person, and their bounding rectangle top is in the bottom 40% um, of the frame. So basically, if their head is in the bottom 40% of the frame, then we need to do something about it. Remember I said we have triggers. So triggers can happen on any update of the data. So Venbridge calls my pseudo data API that updates the data. I can then have a trigger that says, if there is an edit to this data and I can add a query that says, and for example, uh, in the updated fields, the field called labels, which is an array, has an element uh, where the name field is person and the instances bounding box dot top is greater than 0.6, then and only then will this trigger fire. Now at that point, it's like, well, what do I do? And I have a couple of choices with what I can do with this trigger. I can have another event bridge trigger 
So old person falls down, this goes to event bridge. Uh, I then use uh, SES or SNS to send it to myself. Actually, I decided when this trigger fired, it would run a MongoDB serverless function, which would then be able to fire it via Twilio, and if there was any problem with Twilio, then send it over to AWS and send it via um, SNS. So it gives me that extra flexibility. But that was just a you know, kind of personal choice on how I did it. Plus, I, I like working with Twilio. Um, I really do want that message to be delivered now, not queued. Queues are great. Okay, the idea of, of, you know, this message will get there eventually is great, but if that message is there is an old person lying on the floor, right, I want many mechanisms that deliver now and ideally tell me they've had a delivery. So maybe that's a, that's a non-event bridge event. Uh, sorry, still pressing the wrong buttons. I also wanted a daily roundup. I want to be able to see on my phone what's happened that day. So this is one of the dullest graphs in the world in terms of layout. And I feel sad because this is built with MongoDB charts. And charts is a graphical business intelligence tool so you can get your data and you can drag and drop and build all kinds of pretty charts. Whereas I just wanted one that had the time along the bottom for the last three days. And in the top picture, it tells me how many people are in the room. And in the bottom picture, I'm actually filtering that down to there is a person in this particular area of the image, which is the kitchen. So how many times did our old person go in the kitchen, which I'm going to equate to is eating or drinking or getting something. So this is basically telling me I can see that over the course of three days, um, they uh, had one visitor on a couple of the days. They had two visitors on, on the last day. Um, and also at the bottom, I can see that they've been getting up and they've been going into the kitchen. And interestingly, I can see that every day at, at roughly 5.30 a.m., they go and get a glass of water. And I can, I can see the image for this. So I can go, why, why were they in the kitchen at 5.30 a.m.? Oh, getting a glass of water. You know, I can literally jump to that image. So that's nice. So you create these charts with a GUI. You drag, you drop. They generally look much prettier than this. Um, GUI looks like this. You know, I've got my data on the side, and I have lots of different kinds of charts I can do, and I can, I can build them. And then, when I want to take this and put it into my application, there's a nice embedding SDK. So, um, adding that chart to my mobile app was actually a trivial amount of code. And it uses the same authorization, the same authentication that I did to be able to call that function. So, it knows who I am. It only shows me data I'm allowed to see. I can publish these charts to world, I can publish individual charts or a whole dashboard of charts to world, public, and anyone can see them, but I can also apply all the security rules on top of it and then just with a few lines of JavaScript embed it in my own web page, still with that same authentication. Um, I didn't, originally I was just using the charts to do this. And so I dragged the stuff over and I created the chart. But the thing about the charts is the AI that identifies things is a little bit imperfect, as you'd expect from something that has to look at an image and identify where things are. So I wanted to summarize it somewhat. Now, the charts have what's called binning, where you can say, roll up the data for every minute or every hour or every day. And so I could say, what was the maximum number of people that were present in a day or a minute or an hour? But I didn't want to do a minute because I have an image once a minute, and I didn't want to do an hour because I want to know finer granularity than what was happening, you know, what were the maximum number of people present in an hour. I wanted like five or 10 minutes. So I ended up digging into the time series analytics in MongoDB. So MongoDB has window functions so that you can run time series analysis over your data. And I used it in a fairly simple way here to say, analyze this data and basically tell me the maximum number of people present over a 15 minute period and the maximum number of people present in the kitchen over a 15 minute period. I'm also working on another one which will use the same time series analytics to alert me if my person doesn't move for a certain amount of time. So basically, time series analytics and window functions is often the case of given a piece of data X, look at the data around it. Look at the preceding five minutes. So what I'm doing is I'm using that to basically look at the amount of movement that happens over a given time span to see if you know, there's a problem and they've, they've just not moved. 
They've sat down and they've not moved for two hours and want to know about it. So although sleeping in a chair is a, is a thing, you still generally they move. So I built this using MongoDB Compass. Compass is a graphical development tool that lets you build these <coughs> aggregation pipelines, these data transformations to, to look at your data step by step. So we have a pipeline-based approach to analysis. And then what's kind of nice is you can go in this, once you've got it, you've got the right output, and go save as view. And what that will do is it will create a new view in your underlying database. Like an RDBMS view, it will encapsulate that pipeline as like a virtual table, a virtual collection, which meant from the charts, I can just drag that data in and graph it. So it's a pre-processing stage. I could have copied the pipeline and the stuff into charts, but actually save as view just seemed like a much nicer way of doing it. And then, last thing I have is tidying up. So I am taking one photograph at a reasonable resolution once a minute. You can imagine that becomes a, a respectable amount of data. Um, I have chosen a MongoDB cluster. This is running on a, on a free tier, MongoDB cluster, so free for life. Yeah, this whole thing, the only costs associated with it are uh, the AWS costs, but the, I'd get that free for a year if I had their, their service as well. Um, but that only gives me 512 megabytes of data storage. I don't want to keep images longer than I need to. I want to be able to go back if there was an incident and have a look back 24, 48 hours, but I don't want to keep the images longer than I need to, and they're taking up space. So MongoDB gives me a few options. The simplest one is what's called time to live. MongoDB will automatically delete records for you at a certain age. You can set that up and be go. Simple. It also has a thing called online archive. That's much more fun. What that will do is it will automatically take them and move them to files in S3 for you on a schedule. Anything that's more than 48 hours old, please automatically put this record as a file in S3, in JSON or BSON or whatever you want to store it as, and even allow you to still query against it. So you can have it as if it hadn't moved from the database, but it's moved to S3 in the background, saving in storage costs. But I genuinely don't need this data beyond about 48 hours. So what I have instead is a schedule trigger that looks for any record more than 48 hours old, and it goes in and it just nulls out the image field. So I keep all of the metadata, so I can do long-term analysis. We can look at, is our old person getting up later, getting up earlier, moving around less? You know, we can actually start, and this is, it, it seems creepy, but this is definitely very helpful for their welfare. Um, so in the end, I have a schedule trigger that basically just removes the image field from things that are more than 48 hours old but keeps all the metadata for me. And, and that's it. That's a kind of end-to-end -end of my process. I should probably have another architecture slide in here, but I'm sure if any of you are actually interested, you're going to go and download these slides and read that code and look more interested. I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. I hope this was interesting. Uh, and